Okay, so we are at Stansted today. With I've got the weather in Microsoft Flight Simulator set to a few clouds, so we get nice clean weather above us. We've got the A320, the fly-by-wire A320 on the ground in front of us, and we're going to go for a fly in it. And the reason we're going to do that is to go through some of the common mistakes people make with trying to fly the big jets and especially when they're learning the things that cause them to get into difficulties really easily so we're just going to go and have a quick look on little nav map so you can see i've got a, a flight plan in mind here that we're going to go through just taking off from stansted runway 22 flying a circuit and then coming back into stansted runway 22 again so we'll go through and look at the very basic setting the airbus up and get the the plane ready from cold and dark program the flight plan in and have an explanation of how the master control panel works and we'll look at that while we're in flight as well and we'll talk about some of the common mistakes people make and how they get into trouble and the easiest remedies for that okay so to begin with you'll notice i am going to look around the cockpit by holding the right the right mouse button down and panning the mouse and when I want to look closely at something, I'm going to roll the mouse wheel. And when I roll the mouse wheel, I'm going to put the mouse somewhere that's dead area in the cockpit. Otherwise, it could influence something. Yeah, so that's how I'm going to look around very remarkably quickly. Once you get practiced at it, you can look around the cockpit very quickly. And that's going to be, we'll talk about that later, about the most common cause of difficulties. Okay, so to get the Airbus started, the first thing we need to do is go and turn on the batteries. We have access to external power here, so we may as well use it. So we switch it on. First thing we do after that is go and switch on the ADIAS alignment. If you've got it set to realistic in the fly-by-wire, this will take a number of minutes. I haven't. I've got it set to instant. So normally, if you've got it set to realistic, you would get a timer show up here of how many minutes it's going to take but you can see everything's already appeared it's already lined up okay so if we then go back overhead we can turn on the crew power supply straight away we can turn on the APU now so APU is the auxiliary power unit it's the jet engine in the rear of the plane if we go and pan around outside is this small hole here I've talked about this before but if you've not seen any of the videos you can see it's generating heat now the APU is generating now it provides electrical power and compressed air and it's only needed during startup the compressed air is used to spin up the jet engines once you've got the engines started up they provide the electricity so you can then turn off the APU okay so we've switched on the APU and started it if we go and look down here on the displays, you can see if it's generating any electricity yet. So by default, when you turn the APU on, this screen appears. There you go. It's now generating electricity. So we can turn off the ground power now. Okay. And that big clunk is the ground power disappearing from the aircraft, which is fine because we're generating power from the APU. Okay. The next thing we might want to do before we do anything else is go and brighten the screens up. So you've got the, the rollers on the top left, uh, the, these two screens, and mirroring it on the other side of the cockpit, the top two knobs control the brightness of the two screens next to the co-pilot seat. The two central screens are controlled by the two knobs down here. So you can brighten it all up so it's easy to see. Okay. So what do we do what do we do next? We are going to do things slightly out of order because we're just doing a demonstration flight. Normally you wouldn't start the engines until you are being pushed back. But we're going to go and get things ready now. So we're going to go and turn the lights on. Beacon and taxi lights. We're going to turn on the no smoking sign, the seatbelt sign. We're going to arm the emergency lights. You'll notice how quickly I'm being able to, to whip around the cockpit and do this. We're going to turn the pumps on. That's the fuel pumps, I should say. Because without the fuel pumps, you can't start the engines. Well, you, you know, you can't properly start them because there's no fuel in them to burn. The next thing we're going to do is turn on APU bleed. So this is the compressed air. We're feeding it now to the engines. 
So then if we come down here and we start the engines, put them on start mode, you will see on the engineering display the N2 numbers are coming up and you can hear the engines spinning up in the background. So we're just going to wait for that to happen. They'll come up through about 25%. If we didn't have the fuel pumps on or the air bleed, you wouldn't go past 25%. So that sudden rev up you hear when it gets to 25 is because we have the, um, the fuel pumps. So we wait for the engines to stabilise. You will hear a clunk in the background once the engines stabilise, and that is the electricity automatically cross-feeding across to use the engines instead of the APU. So if we keep our ears open, we'll hear that. And there it goes. So now we can go overhead and we can turn off the APU. So we turn off the APU bleed first and turn off the APU. We don't have to hit the start button again. We can also, we don't need external power, so that's just saying avail over there if we look closely at it, which means it's available to use because we're still sat here at the, um, the gate. So that's pretty much it in terms of the primary flight systems of what we need to do. If we go and look on the screen, you'll see that it's complaining. We haven't got the predictive wind shear switch on and we haven't got TCAS. So predictive wind shear is part of the flight dynamics of the Airbus. And it's here, it's a little tiny switch down by the speed brake. And the TCAS is the traffic collision and avoidance system. That's this panel over here at the far bottom right of the central pedestal. You just sw switch it to on and then you can change its mode to T-A-R-A -A, typically. Okay, so now you can see it's just telling us we've got the seat belts on, we've got the no smoking sign, we've got the parking brake on and we've got the APU is available. So if we switch the available buttons, you'll notice it doesn't do anything because we're not actually running the APU. OK, at this point, we can do a pushback. So I've got a bit of a, a nice little helper here to help us do that. There's a free add-on from FlightSim.2 called uh, Pushback. And we can start the pushback. Cockpit to ground. This is ground. Stand by. So the advantages of using the pushback tool is you can actually steer the pushback. So if we go and have a look around ourselves, we can see we want to go that way eventually. So we need to reverse and put the tail round to the left from the way we're looking now. We'll just wait for the tug to line up. Bypass pin is installed. All doors and hatches closed and all ground equipment is removed. The parking brakes are set. You may lift. Parking brake set. So Looking this is aircraft. a more realistic reflection of what really happens. You will notice the plane is being lifted into the air. This is what really happens with the tug on Standing a real plane. So that's something this um, add-on simulates. So we can say we want to do a reverse pushback. Start and push. Parking brake set. Okay, cleared for push start. Please release parking brake. So, I release the parking brake. Parking brakes are released. Commencing pushback. You can start the engines in sequence. Yeah, we'll start in the sequence. So, will you notice that they were saying about starting the engines, and I did it out of sequence just to get on with this because this is just a demonstration. Normally, you would start your engines while you're being pushed back. So, we can change the direction of the tug look. And we can also speed it up. Obviously, you can be completely unrealistic about this. Turn him into kind of a the Formula One driver of the tug world. And then we can stop the pushback. Okay, pushback completed. Please set your parking brake. So, it's my parking, parking brake. Set. Parking brake set. Lowering aircraft. So he's dropping the nose back onto the tarmac, so putting the wheels back down, basically. Ground. Startup is complete. You may disconnect. Roger. Good engine start. Clear to disconnect. C 
see you at the side. Have a good flight. Holding position waiting for the visual. Thank you and goodbye. Okay, so if we get back inside now, there's a few things to go over that we were going to talk about. About the common causes of problems. The most common cause you see of anybody, or problems that anybody has with trying to fly the big jets, if they're not practiced at it, is they are too slow. They are too slow at getting to the controls and too slow reacting to what's happening. They are behind the aircraft, if that makes sense. You have to be ahead of what's happening. You have to be predicting. Yeah, and you have to get to the various controls around the cockpit you need to quickly. And a lot of that just comes with practice, but you can help yourself by doing things in certain ways. Now, you saw me mention earlier, I look around the cockpit with the mouse. And I can do that remarkably quickly. Only, it only takes a little bit of practice, but I can zoom around quickly with the mouse, zoom in if I need to, to get a, a closer look, and zoom back out, and I can press F to come back to the, the pilot's view straight away. I think this method is much faster than any other. Obviously, if you've got add-ons that can control the various panels with physical switches in front of you, that's even better. But if you haven't, and I haven't, Get used to holding the right mouse button down and panning around with the mouse and using the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. Yeah. The next thing to be aware of, you need to know where the primary flight controls are and how to use them and to map them to physical controls if you've got them. So you will notice in my case, I've got the air brake mapped. I've got the flaps mapped. I can twist my joystick to operate the rudder pedals. Obviously I can stir the stick around to control the primary flight surfaces. And obviously the throttles as well. I've got complete control over the throttles and you can see that's actually lit the plane up like a Christmas tree because I shouldn't have done that. So I've got a warning here, this is a good tip. If you get warnings showing up before you've actually done anything, go and click the clear button on the Ecamm screen and they'll go away. Yeah, so the, the master warning up here doesn't clear the warnings off the screen. The clear button down here does. But of course they won't go away unless you've remedied the situation. In that case I had pushed the throttles forwards while I still had the parking brake on and the aeroplane didn't like it one bit. Okay, so we're going to move the flaps to takeoff position, which I'm just doing here. So we did that with my joystick, you can see the flaps stick has moved to setting number one. I can turn off the um, engine start mode, actually I've got a physical switch for that so you know, even trying to do it with the mouse didn't do anything. So I can release the parking brake now, you can see that's flicked around and we will gently start rolling if I just advance the throttles even a tiny bit. But we're not going to just yet, we'll get out into the taxiway into the middle here but then we're going to sit still for a while and go and program our route in into the uh, flight management computer or the MCDU as it's called in the Airbus and then we'll have a talk about the master control panel for the autopilot and what the buttons do and why you need to know and why you have to be quick at operating them Okay, so we're going to put the parking brake back on while we're sat here with the engines on idle. And we're going to go and program our route because we haven't touched anything in the flight management computer yet. So we'll go back in here. Um, so I've gone into the FMC page and the first thing it shows you is status of the system. You can completely ignore that. The only thing you need to be aware of is the bottom line is a message line or a scratch pad for you to type into. If I press the clear button, that will go away. So any messages in there will go away if you press clear. So we need to go and program our flight. So we're going from EGSS, which is Stansted's ICAO code. We're going to EGSS. We're just going to do a quick circuit around Stansted. So if I click the soft key next to the FROM2, it comes up with that page. You just return and there it is in the FROM2. We can put a flight number in if we want. So A, B, C, one, two, three. 
generally speaking, if you see squares on the fields, oh, flight number is in use. So we're not going to bother with that. If you see squares in a field, it usually means it's um, a required field. But in some cases, you don't have to fill it. So cost index, 99. Cost index relates to how aggressively we're going to let the aircraft accelerate when it's on a managed mode, when the, you know, when the plane is flying itself. Um, you can take anything up to, I think, 200 on the cost index. Obviously, the higher numbers mean the plane is going to be quite wasteful on fuel. The cruise level, we're going to be flying at 5,000 feet. So if I put 5,000 in, that will calculate that and give us the flex temperature for the engines. We don't need to worry about what that is at the moment. And then we can skip across to performance if we really want to, and we can put in the V-speeds. And it's not going to let us at the moment because we haven't put flaps in. So we're going to say we're taking off with flaps 1. And will it let us do it now? Yes, it will. So as soon as you put the flaps in, you can actually program the V-speeds. But just by clicking on them, and it will automatically calculate them. So you just click each button twice. And those will appear on the indicated airspeed ribbon to give you a marker of when to rotate. So you've got V1, which is the minimum speed to take off essentially, to leave the ground. VR, which is when you should rotate, and then V2. Um, I'll do another video another time about what these exactly mean, and a lot of the other terms like transition altitudes and all that kind of stuff, to explain what it all actually is. So the thing we're worried about today is just to go and put a flight plan in. So we're going from EGSS to EGSS, so we're looking at the flight plan page on the MCDU. Now to insert waypoints in between these, all I have to do is key a waypoint name in into the scratch pad and then click on the waypoint that I want it to appear in front of. So if I go through them in order, the first one I want is ECVEG, E-K-V-E-G. So E-K-V-E-G. So I'm going to select the destination airport because I want it to happen before we get there. And there it goes, it's in between the two. Notice there's a discontinuity. In the various models of the Airbus or the fly-by-wire Airbus, you may or may not get the discontinuity appearing in between the um, departure and destination airports. In, the, in this version, this is the development version as of February 2022. This does appear in between any um, initialized routes where you haven't put a plan in yet. So LCN05 is the next one. So LCN05. So we want it after ECVEG but before EGSS. So if we insert it in front of EGSS, there it goes. Same again for BEMID. B E M I D. B E M I D. And we're going to scroll this up slightly and insert it on top of the destination EGSS. Then we're going to go for brain. B R A I N. And we're going to insert that again on top of EGSS. And again, at this point, it's showing us there's actually two waypoints called brain. One is 15 miles from us. The other is 3,638 miles away. So it's obviously this one. We'll scroll that up so we can see BEMID, brain. Notice it's calculating where we need to start descending along the route automatically. Abbott and Upgear are the last two. Abbott. So we'll put that on top of our destination airfield. So that's appeared now. We'll scroll this up a bit further. And Upgear was the last one. Up G I R. And we'll put that on top of EGSS again. So that's all of our waypoints in. So now we can concentrate on getting rid of the discontinuity lines. So we can hit clear and click next to that one and it vanishes. And let's go and scroll backwards up the flight plan. When I'm scrolling, an easy way to think about this is you are pushing this screen in the direction of the arrow you click. So if I want to pull the screen down, I press the down arrow. Yeah, and there's no discontinuities left in that flight plan. Notice it, it wraps around, you can keep pressing one arrow and it will loop around. So to have a close look at your flight plan on the primary flight display, you can change the mode of the primary flight display, or the plan mode as it calls it, 
to plan instead of arc. When you put it on plan mode instead of arc mode, the range still works, but you're looking at a particular waypoint. You're actually looking at the waypoint on the second line down of this display. And as you scroll through them, so ECVEG, LCN, so you'll notice this is scrolling and corresponding with what's in the centre of the screen. So you can check your flight plan to make sure it looks correct. And if you think about it, what we've just seen broadly mirrors what we've just done here. OK, so if we go back to arc mode, it will centre back on us with north face, or oh, sorry, in the direction of the aircraft being straight up the display. And this will spin around as we rotate the aircraft. So the next thing to think about is QNH. If we just press B, it will correct itself. And because I put it on a nice day, it is 2992, so we don't need to worry about it. So this is the barometric pressure that calibrates the altimeter, yeah, and tells you how far above sea level you are. So obviously you need to get that accurate to the airfield you are landing at or departing from. So your altimeter reads the nearby um, geography accurately. OK, um, master control panel is the next thing we're going to have a quick think about. We're going to use managed mode today. While we're flying along, we'll have a play with selected mode. So you'll notice when you hover the mouse over the knobs of the master control panel for the autopilot. If you click the top half, it says managed mode and a dot appears and the numbers vanish and there's just a dot. If you click selected mode, the dot vanishes and the numbers come up. So that's selected mode means I want the aircraft to do this speed. Managed mode means the aircraft's going to make its own mind up. Yeah, and it's pre-programmed to do the right thing most of the time. You can actually manipulate what it does by going down the right hand on the flight plan page and clicking the buttons next to each leg and programming in how you want the plane to behave at that juncture. But by default, it's actually pretty good and it will have you know, selected something appropriate, usually. So heading goes the same way. If you select selected heading mode, you can say, I want the plane to go that particular direction. And if you notice, there's a little blue arrow that appears on the outside of the compass rows in plan mode, oh, sorry, in, in arc mode. And obviously that's your target heading that you've set on the master control panel. So if the autopilot is switched on, the plane will start turning towards that heading if it has been selected. So typically, if you do, if you're on selected mode, you will have to actually, you know, well, you, you can see if you look closely, you are pulling it if you click the bottom half. So you do actually have to pull it to select. We're going to go for managed mode. We've got managed speed and managed heading. If you weren't going to use managed speed, you have to think, OK, I'm going to be climbing out straight off the runway. So I would want probably 220 knots as my uh, selected airspeed, if I'm going to use selected airspeed. Does that make sense? So we'd be going for like 220 to get into the standard instrument departure that we might have programmed. So if we're going to do that, we would do that. But if we do managed, we don't have to really worry about it. We, we know we're going to fly our route at 5,000 feet. So again, the altitude has managed mode and selected mode. So we'll go to 5,000 and we can say it's going to be managed mode. You notice when it was too low, it couldn't do managed mode to 1,000 feet. The reason for that is you can't use managed mode within 1,000 feet of the height you're at it has to be more than a thousand feet away for it to bother doing it. Uh, if you went for selected mode on the heading, you would then have to use vertical speed. So that's what the far right knob is for. So you can either use minus numbers or positive numbers to climb at a given rate. But you're better off in the Airbus just going for managed mode and not worrying at all about vertical speed mode. OK. So this comes down to what we were, again, I'm going to repeat again what I said already. You need to learn where these things are and be able to operate them one after another quickly once we are rolling. 
because when we come off the runway we're gonna pull up get clear of the ground get the gear up the flaps up and then switch on the auto throttle and the autopilot yeah if you don't do those things quickly you quickly run into trouble if you're going to use you can actually use auto throttle on the takeoff and it will go to toga and take you off but we're going to take off manually just to show you that sequence of doing things quickly if you don't do things quickly enough particularly on climb out and this is the most common mistake in the book with somebody just starting out you're going to end up over speeding so you'll slam the throttles forward and go racing off down the runway but remember the auto throttle won't work unless the throttles are on the CL'd attempt. Yeah? We will be probably be rolling, won't we? Did I? I haven't really sparking brake yet. We didn't set the alarm off that time. I pulled it back in time. So the auto throttle will only work in the Airbus when the throttles are on the CL detent. So if you're busy climbing out on full throttle and then you start dithering and messing around with the controls, you're going to start thinking, well, what's that beeping I can hear? That'll be the overspeed warning. And if you hear the overspeed, the autopilot will have switched off and you won't be able to switch it back on until you've got rid of the overspeed. So suddenly you're having to go for air brakes and pulling the throttles back. So if you think about it, our sequence on the runway is to accelerate down the runway, get in the air, gear up, flaps up, throttle on the detent, autopilot auto throttle and you have to do those operations remarkably quickly to remain in control of the aircraft if that makes sense or to to hand over control of the aircraft in a timely manner you can save yourself some time by not going for full throttle you can go for toga which is not the maximum amount if you push the throttles right to the stops which is like you can see it here that's max throttle you can see if you look closely toga is not max yeah so obviously if you're in toga you're not at maximum throttle so you've got a couple of extra seconds before you're going to overspeed obviously if you pull up quite steeply off the runway you're not going to overspeed it's just that i've seen it time and time again when people are learning that they have got into a real pickle because they've taken off and by the time they've gone trying to look around the cockpit and they're trying to like press oh what was it control five which number was it oh i can't i can't find it where's the button for the autopilot oh where is it and beep 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 autopilot's off we're over speeding and we're panicking whereas if we sit in the pilot view we can see everything yeah and particularly if we've got controls mapped as well we can just hit the switches flick the levers and we're good okay parking brake off enough of me yapping on and rabbiting on about this so this is about practice it's about knowing your way around the cockpit and it's about knowing the procedure and doing it quickly, being able to get to controls quickly. So if you've got them mapped, great. If you've got switches in front of you, you can just go and flick the switches, great. If you haven't, you need to be good at looking around the cockpit fast and clicking things. Yeah. And in true flight simulator fashion, a car is about to go right underneath the nose of the aircraft. Why do they do it? It's like if anything's moving, they'll go and get in its way on purpose. Okay. So we're just using the outside view here to see the front wheels skidding across the tarmac because we're going too fast or the concrete I should say so we just have a quick check around we've got everything ready the flaps are ready to go So we just do a rolling takeoff, pulling onto the centre line. Whee! Remembering on the fly-by-wire that there is a delay with the um, the nose wheel steering, 
because there's hydraulics on the nose wheel turning the wheels and they're not as fast as your controller. Okay, so full throttle. You can see Mantoga has appeared. So I'm going to go for yep, Toga. So we're just holding the centre line. We'll rotate at 160. Gear up. Flaps up. Notice the speed. We're not over speeding yet. Autopilot on. Flaps. Uh, sorry, the um, throttle back to that CL detent. So we did everything in a timely manner and we can let go of everything now and the plane is going to fly itself. So you can see the plane is accelerating now for 250 knots. It's gone into speed mode. So you can see that reflected here on the indicated... on the, sorry, the primary flight display. So the plane is accelerating towards 250 knots. It's coming up towards 5,000 feet. We'll hear an indication in a moment that it's within 1,000 feet. Or not. Perhaps not on the Airbus. Most of the aircraft you do hear an audio indication of that. You will see a blue marker coming down the altitude ribbon, which is our target altitude. We're at 250 knots, so the aircraft has stopped accelerating. So it gives you some idea. This throttle is not a direct linkage to anything. It's just an electronic switch. When you pull it below CL, you have got manual control of the throttles. But anything above there are actually pre-programmed modes. Obviously, if you have the auto throttle off, then yeah, the full range is you controlling it. But with auto throttle on, the throttle is essentially a switch. And, yeah, and if you're over speeding, you won't have autopilot and you won't have auto throttle. Okay, so this is going to be a very boring flight now because this is what the Airbus is good at, which is following. A flight plan. You'll notice our managed altitude mode has gone away. We're now just in essentially um, altitude hold mode. It's holding 5,000 feet. So the managed part was getting there. There we go. I haven't touched anything. Plane's turning all on its own. It's following the flight plan that we can see here. Can go outside and see that happening. Spin round and see the airfield in the background and we're doing this nice gentle circuit at 5,000 feet so we'll have a little bit of a play around with this flight plan at this point say we wanted to deviate say the air traffic controllers told us can you please fly a certain heading so we can go to selected heading mode and we can roll the heading bug around and we can say we want to fly 200 degrees please because we've just been told by air traffic control to fly 200 degrees so the plane is immediately turning to follow that and then they say oh no we've made a mistake we didn't mean it can you f please revert to your flight plan please so we just put the heading back to managed mode and the plane if we look very carefully at this is going to fly we'll turn it back to 10 miles it's going to fly back to the line all on its own and intercept the line and it will do so at an intercept angle it won't just keep turning towards the line and wiggle all over the place see it's figured out a nice intercept angle to do that so while we're flying along this back leg let's go and play with the altitude as well so we just climbed to 5,000 let's say we wanted to go to 6,000 feet so we'll do selected mode. We can now say how we want to get there. So we roll the vertical speed knob and we say engage 1,000 feet a minute. So as we're doing the turn, because the turn is the heading mode, remember, but the elevators are controlling the pitch of the nose and we're now climbing at 1,000 feet a minute, which you can see on the 
vertical speed up to 6000 so you'll see a blue marker on 6000 will appear should come into view anytime soon hopefully there it comes so say even if it's on its way there and we change our mind we can say actually we didn't want to go to 6000 we wanted to go to 5000 so selected 5000 notice vertical speed has vanished we have to go and choose how to get there so we roll the knob and say come back down to 5000 please at a thousand feet a minute and engage that so to engage it I click the bottom half and it goes back if you want to do managed mode you'll notice we have auto throttle on so regardless of what we do in terms of altitude and vertical speed the plane will do its best to maintain the speed we have set obviously if you get above um, 10,000 feet the plane knows all about that as well and it will start accelerating up to 300 knots or you know whatever the cruise speed is in the conditions so we're coming back down to 5,000 at 1,000 feet a minute So the only reason I'm showing you that you know vertical speed mode is normally you'll be using managed mode and you just click the top half of the altitude knob after changing it and the plane will get on with it. So we can do that again. We'll go for 6,000 feet please. Or 7,000 even. Is he going to let us? 8,000? He's not going to let us, is it? That's interesting. So if it was 18,000. Interesting. I'll have to look up why that's not engaging. Probably because my flight my flight plan is set for 5,000 feet, so it makes no sense. We're at 5,000 feet. So managed altitude mode is going to disregard. Yeah, we're already at 5,000 feet, and we programmed 5,000 in in the MCDU. I imagine that's why. I'll have to actually check that. Regardless of all of that, we actually want to come down to 3,000 feet anyway. So we'll say get to 3,000 in managed mode and it will come down look on its own. So the plane is going to descend now. That's an interesting one. I wonder why it wouldn't climb. The, um, the Airbus autopilot has various laws. So this is where practice comes in to see where those edge cases and to know and go and do a little bit of research and to find out why that happened. And people sometimes turn around to those of us that have flown these planes quite a lot and they say, how do you know these things? We've tried it. Yeah, we've tried it and when something didn't make sense, we went and read the book. So there's very good documentation for the Airbus. And if you don't want to just read the book, you can go and look online and you can find real pilots flying them answering questions and write, writing written up, um, answers to questions. So you can usually get very good answers. The worst thing you can do is going to a forum and find... I don't want to paint everybody by the same brush here. A lot of enthusiasts might have the wrong answer if they're not a proper pilot, so you're best off looking for the real pilots that are describing things. I know I would actually prefer a pilot's answer over my own. <laughs> I've actually had, I've been very lucky in the past and I've got to talk to some real pilots both Airbus and Boeing 737 pilots and badgered them with questions and they were really friendly and helpful and they put a lot of kind of myths to rest for me about things that we do and why we do them I think you know to do with procedure even why do you do that before that and it turns out most of the answers to those questions is well you could kill somebody But if, uh, you actually find that some of the procedures around the cockpit are company specific as well. So things like, um, one just came up recently, I was talking to somebody. If you look on the Airbus, there are markings here alongside the trim wheel. And it's to do with setting up the trim at takeoff to do with the centre of gravity of the aircraft. And you can actually see it in 
the flight control section there's a, a pitch up marker. So you can program the MCDU at takeoff for a given amount of trim for the weight. So you can calculate it and you can calculate it over in the fly pla flight pad as well. But I'm going to do a video about that at some point in the future because that's quite an interesting subject. If, you, if you've ever gone down the runway in the A320 and the nose has ballooned into the air, it's because you didn't program the trim for the weight of the aircraft. So you can do that so then you get a nice smooth roll on the runway. But it's interesting that on about procedures or getting back to procedures, apparently not all operators bother with that. So not all of them go to the extreme of programming the the um, the trim to trim the aircraft for the weight that's in it. So you know, so there's nothing untoward happening on the runway. I mean, it's it's very easy for the pilot just to react anyway. As the nose starts to raise, they could give it a tiny bit of forward pressure because you're you're going to rotate anyway. And once you're in the air in the Airbus the plane's going to go the direction it's pointing because of the flight systems on it. Okay, so we're turning in towards our destination. So, when we programmed our flight, did we actually go and put in the approach? Let's go and check. If we go to flight plan, no, we didn't. So we're going EGSS, we go to arrival, we're going to land on runway 22. And we're going to insert that into our flight plan. So notice now it's actually got some instructions here. It's going to start decelerating and it's got some extra waypoints it's inserted to do with landing. So the plane will start slowing down all on its own in a moment because I have programmed into the flight plan that we are actually landing on a given runway. So you're going to see today an auto land. The plane is going to land itself. I'm not going to touch a thing. But again, on the way down, we may grab control. We may have to. In the real world, for whatever reason, maybe you've missed the ILS. You know, you've been all over the place on approach. You've been given, you were in conflict with another aircraft and you've had to do an orbit, whatever. We may have to land manually. And this comes down to another common problem you see with people flying simulators, certainly with the big jets, is actually they can't fly an aeroplane. They can operate the control panels and they've read the books and they've studied everything and they know how to program the MCDU until it's inside out. But as soon as you give them the rudder, the stick and the pedals or the, you know, the throttles, they are in trouble. So it really does pay. Go and play with the Cessnas, the small aeroplanes. Learn to fly an aeroplane because you never quite know when you're going to have to take over yourself. You could have a system failure. You could lose the autopilot. In which case you've got to grab everything, assess what's going on with the aeroplane and fly it. And that's usually where you see people get into trouble. They'll go and do a massive flight, get to the destination, and for whatever reason there's no ILS and they put it in the trees at the side of the runway. I've seen it happen so many times. There is no substitute for actually being able to fly and to take over from the aeroplane. Some, a question came up recently is why do you often see in the real world and in simulators planes get to within half a mile of the runway and they switch off the autopilot and land by hand? Unless you've got auto land and unless your company that you're operating for allows you to use it and unless the ILS also supports auto land you have to switch your autopilot off at 200 feet above ground level. It's the law. It's a common aviation law that when you get to 200 feet above ground level, if you haven't got an aircraft that's rated for auto land and the ILS isn't there for, for auto land and your plane isn't engaged on it, you have to switch it all off and land it yourself. You could have flown in on approach mode, but it makes no difference. So we're going to see approach mode in a moment. So you can see we're turning in towards the airfield now. So we're going to change this screen over to LS mode or landing system mode. 
and it changes the symbology so we've now got a course deviation indicator so that's the direction of the runway we're going that way and this, as this line comes in we're getting closer and closer to being in line with the runway so the plane will start turning left as this sweeps in closer to the center you can see an arrow here this will turn into a diamond here it comes and this will come down when this diamond's in the middle we are in the correct place vertically or above the ground at this distance so the closer we get to the runway that place in the sky gets lower and lower so we have to follow that diamond down towards the ground if we are below that invisible line extended from the runway we can't see it yet if we are a below that invisible line through the sky the diamond is above the yellow line if we are above it the diamond will fall below in the same way that the course de deviation works so you can see where the plane is turning towards the direction of the runway and hopefully it will make a nice neat turn you can see the plane is also slowing down all on its own so we need to start feeding flaps in the plane does not operate the flaps for us Put the gear down. We can go for more flaps. So you can see we are now lined up with the runway and we, we didn't go for approach mode. So here we go. This is a classic case where I have to land it. We have missed the ILS. We can't regain the ILS from above it. Yeah? So I turn off the autopilot. I can leave the auto throttle on. In this situation, I've just switched off the autopilot, not the auto throttle. So all I'm doing now is steering the plane. So I'm nose down. It's going to try and accelerate, so I'll throw out some air brakes to help it. 2,500. Let's just centre the screen up so we can see what's going on inside. So you can see we're still way above that diamond. So let's get the nose down. Go slightly to the left. So we're watching the course deviation indicator and the ILS. So that was a classic situation where we missed the ILS. If we get below it, we can engage approach mode. So again, this is just piloting skills of being able to use the stick to get us back in the right place in the sky. So let's go for approach mode now. And it's on. Okay, so we're now the plane is going to follow the course deviation indicator and the vertical marker. Oh, the autopilot wasn't on because I switched it off. Yeah, so we approach mode, autopilot on. The plane's now doing it. Again, this is another problem if you're talking to somebody about it. You can get distracted just by wanting to concentrate on something and you miss something else. So autopilot's on, auto throttle's on, approach mode's 1, on. If we switch on both autopilots now, you can only do this when approach mode is on. And you can see it's lit up now saying CAT3 Jewel. And it will change in a moment to say 1, land. 000. That's the... Um, TCAS is now saying TA only because it changes mode as you get near the ground. So glide slope has been acquired. That means the diamond over here. Plane is flying itself. I've let go of everything. So we we um, all we did was took manual control to get us back into an environment where the autopilot could come back on or oh, the the approach mode could be enabled this will change over to land mode in a moment 500 so get ready remember 200 feet above the ground is our cutoff we're reading the numbers from here it's gone to land mode we're reading the numbers here this is our radar altitude over the ground so if we got to 200 feet and we had problems, we'd go to manual. So even though the plane's trying to land itself, we keep an eye on it. You know, looking at the airspeed, 200. looking at our position in relation to the ILS. 
so I'm not touching anything. The plane's going 100. to flare itself and hold the centre line after it lands. I am getting ready 50, on the throttles to pull them 40, back. 30, 20, 10. Retard. So it's telling me to pull Retard. the throttles back. And I've gone for reverse thrust. I still haven't touched anything. So we can come back to about 70 knots on reverse thrust and then we go for wheel brakes. We could throw the air brakes out as well if we wanted to. Okay, so engines off of reverse thrust and wheel brakes. And lift the flaps. So I guess the lesson today isn't so much about specific buttons or switches in the aircraft. It's about your ability to jump in and take control and activate switches quickly and know where they are quickly and to get back after you've clicked them to being in control of the aircraft. So we're talking you know, in a second to get to that switch and hit it and be back. If it's taken you more than a couple of seconds you can actually cause more problems because by the time you've done what you needed to do it's too late and a different situation has developed. So the thing to practice is st common procedures like on liftoff, you know, coming away from the runway. This is a classic of what I just said. Like, I'm talking to you and I'm not concentrating on what I'm doing. Um, yeah, the classic one was on departure from the runway, not going through the various things we needed to do quickly enough. If we don't do it quickly enough, we end up overspeeding, then the autopilot disengages and the plane continues on in a straight line and you miss the entrance into the standard instrument departure that perhaps you were aiming for. Same is true on descent. If you're not in the correct place in the sky to gain approach mode, the autopilot won't let you do it. If you haven't programmed your route into the MCDU properly, the ILS frequency won't be pre-programmed. so the plane won't be able to go into approach mode because it won't have a glide slope to follow. There's all sorts of things and it's just about practicing and knowing if things go wrong that you can take over and you can fly a plane. So it really is before you go and get lost in trying to play games with master control panels and autopilots and flight directors and all kinds of things, learn how to fly a plane and learn how to operate switches quickly. Once you can do that, you've got a huge advantage. Okay. I'm sure you don't want to watch me roll back and switch the plane off, so... I'm going to stop recording there and stop... repeating myself endlessly. It's like a scratched record. Um, I'll see you again soon. See you soon. Bye.